The Gospel reading is from John chapter 13, verses 31 to 35. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God had been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love for one another. I am so impressed you got all the hard names right. I am so impressed. Every once in a while you get to experience some unexpected joy. When I was first appointed here, my daughter was one. And um, when we left, she was eight. And now she's 22. I know. She's sitting up front with me. And the unexpected joy is I just, one of my fondest memories uh, was Sunday morning. She would sit up front by the pulpit with me just about every week. It's just kind of nice to sit with you again. Yeah. It's a good time. Would you pray with me, please? Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Melt us and mold us. Fill us and use us. Open our ears to hear your voice. Open our minds to help us understand your word. And open our hearts to fill us with your love until it overflows into our lives. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O oh God. For you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I don't know about anybody else, but... This has probably been one of the longest weeks ever. And I kind of felt that like Tuesday. <laughs> I, I did something this fall that I haven't done since I was here, actually. I'm, I'm taking a class. Now, I've taken, you know, workshops and courses and things that really were just looking back easy. But, like, I'm taking, like, a real class with reading and homework. And so I've had, over the last couple of weeks, two major projects to get done. And I just, I had my last class on Tuesday, and I just got done with it. And I just thought to myself, I'm tired. It's exhausting. And then just with work and everything else, tired mentally and physically. And so by the end of the week, I, I needed a good laugh. I just every once in a while, you just need a good laugh. And so a friend of mine suggested I Google the phrase, you had one job. Now, I want to just let you know, when a friend says you should Google a phrase, be careful what that phrase is before you enter it into the search bar. Trust me, you don't, some things you just don't want in your search history. Um, but you had one job. Now, the results were a hilarious, tragic parade of failures and poor planning, and every once in a while, just those moments of what were they thinking? So I provided just a couple of examples. Let's take a look at some of the, you had one job. How hard is it to put a label on right? Let's look at the next one. I don't remember the order of these. Oh, it says me. I thought it said men. Oh, okay. This makes me wonder, what other products would you ever describe without using the actual name? Not long yellow things. Of course, they're, they're round orange things. Okay. Sometimes reminded me of the back room is a thrifty pen. Okay. Now, I gotta tell you, tell you the truth. Um, in the greater Eldersburg metropolitan area, we have the second largest Walmart on the East Coast. 
I know, it's impressive. I don't like going to Walmart, but every once in a while I like to go to People Watch. Because it's an interesting clientele that come to the second largest Walmart on the East Coast. And I would love to put this door. Because <laughs> the line would be around the corner. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, read it carefully. You don't want to be the person behind the person who reads it literally. Now this one, I'm not so, I think this is a brilliant idea. I run a lot, and so in the summertime, I could take a rest and a shower all at the same time. I'm not too opposed to that one. What's our last one? There we go. Jesus must have been there. <laughs> but, you know, we look at these and we chuckle because really, how hard is it if you don't want to replace all the bottles? How long does it really take to change the size? <laughs> and I look at these and I don't know about you, but it makes me feel a little bit better about my ability to do my job. And we wonder, how could something so simple go so wrong? And then I think about the Jesus stories that are in the Gospels. And I imagine to myself, uh, Jesus returning today, and the first words out of his mouth, you had one job. Just imagine him saying that to his followers. You had one job, to love. What happened? And I can imagine all of the excuses and rationalizations coming out of the mouths of his faithful followers. I can imagine the blame and the finger pointing. And then I wonder to myself about the excuses I might give. Or the spin that I might uh, try to put into play around my actions. What story would I come up with for not being able to do the one task that is, that is at the core of the job description of what it means to be a disciple. And if I really believe that God is love, and I really believe that Jesus is the perfect expression of that love, then will any of the excuses that I give even matter? And it's not like I didn't know what I was signing up for. There's no fine print when it comes to Jesus. As I said to the kids, when Jesus was asked, what's the most important commandment? What's, what's the most important rule? What's the most important thing we can do? Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, it doesn't get any clearer than that. Love God, love your neighbor, sign here. And I always thought that, that Christians were supposed to care about people. I mean, not necessarily agree with them not really necessarily believe what they believe, not even like them, just show some basic human uh, dignity to another person, to care about them, to treat them well, to love them, to, to see them as somebody who God loves. But then I, I witness how Christians treat those who are outside the church, and I witness how Christians treat one another in the church, and I just shake my head sometimes. You have one job. I mean, in a nutshell, following Jesus just simply means doing what Jesus said to do. It's not about believing the right thing. It really boils down to, to doing the right thing. To loving others when they're hungry and hurting. When they're grieving and afraid. When they're homeless and feel alone, when they think they're unloved and forgotten, when tragedy befalls them and injustice assails them. I mean, when we look at it, those are the things in the gospel that broke Jesus' heart. And if they broke Jesus' heart, maybe they should break our hearts too. And I guess I'm at the point in life, I know you get to a point in life that there's just some things you don't care anymore. I mean, the things that matter, but, you know, I don't really, I'm not really as interested anymore in telling people what I believe 
as I am in showing them what I believe. I mean, I really want to live a life that if I do not profess my spiritual beliefs, people would still know what they were based on what I do or based on the causes I support or based mainly on the way I treat other people. I mean, the way we treat people, I think, is really the only meaningful expression of our belief system. It's that one space that everything we value is on display. And that's what's at the center of what it means to be a Christian who practices in a United Methodist Church. It's, it's what is at the center of the movement started by John Wesley. One of the most impactful experiences I've had recently, in 2016 I was able to go on a pilgrimage uh, to England and to spend some time in the country and walk in the footsteps of John and Charles Wesley to go where they were born, to, to visit places where they were raised, where they went to school and where they launched the movement we now know as the United Methodist Church. And uh, it really got me in touch with what he was thinking and then reading his sermons, one of his most famous sermons is entitled Catholic Spirit. And in that sermon, he writes the following. Though we can't, cannot think alike, may we not love alike? May we not be of one heart, though we are not of one opinion? Without all doubt, we may. England in the time of Wesley was very divided. They had just gone through years of upheaval politically and religiously, and there was a large gap between the rich and the poor. And in this sermon, he was challenging people to listen to those with whom they disagree and to focus on what they had in common, to build bigger tables to make room, to build uh, bridges instead of walls. And I think the world in which we live today is not that different than Wesley's world. Now our labels are different. We're no longer Whigs and Tories or conformists and dissenters, Anglicans and Puritans. No, we're Democrats and Republicans, fundamentalists and progressives, liberals and conservatives. And this division, this conflict in which we find ourselves drains us of our spiritual vitality. And I think for some it leaves us longing for a different approach and if we're not longing for a different approach, I think we just better check ourselves and get a different approach because what we're doing is not working. And how do we embrace an approach that is rooted in love for others? You know, Paul gives us one way to look at it. We heard it in our letter to the Ephesians that was read this morning. Walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. So by approaching other people with humility, gentleness, and patience. That's a different approach. And then he goes on to, to write to the Corinthian church, which was also deeply divided. And in his letter, his first letter to the Corinthian church, he is describing the characteristics of, of the Christian life and what love in the Christian life looks like. And I, I like to remind people, 1 Corinthians 13, we most often hear it at weddings, but it has nothing whatsoever to do with marriage or love between a husband and wife. It's actually an extension of chapter 12. Because, you know, Paul didn't write, here's chapter 1, here's chapter 2. No, he just wrote a letter. And the part that leads up to, to what we call the 13th chapter, Paul is describing all of the different gifts that are found in the church, in the body of Christ, and, and how the church should work together. And then what he says at the last line of what we call chapter 12, he goes, and I will show you a more excellent way. He wants to show us a more excellent way of being the body of Christ, and then he launches into what we call the love chapter, and he writes, love is patient, love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. I mean, what would it look like if 
in our interactions with other people, they were grounded in Paul's understanding of love with humility and gentleness and patience. I think it means that we would assume the best, not the worst in other people. We'd give people the benefit of the doubt. We would speak well of others and not poorly. We treat them as we hope to be treated. We would listen more and talk less. And we would really take the time to walk in another person's shoes and try to understand what they believe and why they believe that. And if we don't want to listen to Paul, then maybe we should listen to Jesus and follow his example. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, it's a little unusual to choose to read from a passage that we usually read during Lent, and this is Advent. But if you look at this story, right before we get to this part, we have Jesus washing the disciples' feet and then starting the institution of the Lord's Supper, sharing the bread and the cup with the disciples. And so right before this, he's washed their feet. They've had communion. Uh, Judas leaves to go betray Jesus, and the rest of the disciples are kind of all sitting around in a state of confusion. And in this moment of drama and tension, Jesus offers the words of our lessons. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And I love that part, just as I have loved you. Because that puts Jesus at the center of our love. And his words kind of tell us a lot about the kind of love he's talking about. It's not a romantic love. It's not just about simply being nice to other people. It's not about loving those who we know are going to love us back. I mean, if you think about it, Jesus had just served communion and washed the feet of all the disciples, including Peter, who he knew would betray him or deny him, and Judas, who he knew would betray him. I mean, we didn't get in the story, oh, no, I'm sorry, Peter, I'm not going to wash your feet because you're going to deny me tomorrow. He didn't get to Judas, nope, I'm sorry, you don't get communion because I know you're about to go out and betray me. He served it, and he served everyone. And then he goes in the next few hours to demonstrate how far he will go to exemplify God's love when he's arrested and beaten and crucified. Love is hard. The love Jesus is talking about that we're to show to other people is hard because it is self-sacrificing. It's about putting the good of another before our own good. And I also find it interesting that these were the words that Jesus chose to leave with his disciples. He could have said anything to them as his final words. He could have said, go out and die with me. He could have said, keep the faith. He could have said, when I'm gone, go preach and teach what I've shown you. But no, he said, go love one another. He could have said anything. But he chose these simple and challenging words. And he chose them because one more time he wanted to remind them that God is love. And that love should be the cornerstone of who we are as disciples of Jesus Christ. And these words will tell people who we follow and what we believe. How we love one another will say more than any sermon or sacrament or festival or building or jewelry or family value that we hold. It's that love for another person. And it's not just some lofty goal. It's a love that's actually achievable. I'm sure it's one that you've already achieved at some point in time. Now, we may not love perfectly, but we do love. And we have to remind ourselves every now and again that we're capable of that. I mean, just think about a moment. Think about a time this past week, and if it's been a rough week, maybe this past month, in which you chose to love another person. A time when maybe you looked out for the interest of somebody else. A time when you overlooked uh, a slight from a friend, or a time when you put your goals on hold to help someone else achieve theirs. I mean, it could be some large act of love, 
or a smaller act of love. It really doesn't matter. The point is you know that you are capable of doing this. And we have to remind ourselves that we're capable of doing this because I can guarantee you that sometime this week or sometimes this month, sometime this month, you will be in a situation where it will be very difficult to love the other person. There will come a time, and maybe it's already happened, when there will be somebody who has hurt you, who you are having trouble forgiving, or a family member who has let you down. And just as, P as Jesus washed and served both Peter and Judas, we are called to extend grace and hospi hospitality to all. To all of our sisters and brothers, even the ones who insult us, who talk about us behind our back, who don't like us very much, who support a candidate that we can't stand, who hold values that are opposite of ours. One of the things we believe or we say is our mission as the United Methodist Church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. But often we forget that transformation has to begin with us. We have to first be transformed by God's love in order to be able to share God's love. And so with that transforming love of God in our hearts, we're able to accomplish that purpose. We're able to do that one job to love others without judgment, without bias, without fear or qualification or exception. To love as Christ loved us, both the people we like already and those we can't stand. Those who live the way we think they should live and those who don't. The people who are just like us and the people who are so different from us, we just can't even imagine what we have in common. We're to love as Jesus loved, them, loved us by walking beside them, eating with them, caring for them, listening to them, including the them as an integral part of us. John Wesley firmly believed that our differences should not lead to a breakdown in communication, but should be a way of, toward greater understanding. And he wasn't talking about agreement. He's talking about respect for another person. He, he's talking about having an understanding of another person's point of view. It's not about winning or losing. It's about us growing in the love and grace we have for God and for one another. So let me leave you with some things to, to think about, some things to ponder. Does your life give any evidence of an encounter with God? Does your life give any evidence of the fruits of the Spirit that Paul talks about? Do others see in you love and joy, peace and patience, kindness and goodness, trust and gentleness and self-control? I guess what it boils down to is does anyone see in you the difference and encounter with God that he has? My prayer is that they do. In Jesus' name, amen.